Good morning, friends. <laughs> Scripture reading this morning is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 9. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, has quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. For by grace you are saved, through faith, and not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a delight to be with you today. My wife would have wished to join me, but she's having surgery Monday morning and the doctors took her off all pain medication until then. So she's having a challenge. It's knee surgery and uh, she, um, she's actually looking forward to it. Have you ever had a body part go so bad that you you want to do something about it, even if it means a, a surgery? Anyway, it's, uh, it is a delight to be with you. I wish you could have been here too. We, um, <clears throat> some years ago, as I was working in various places around North America for the church, <clears throat> I made a determination that every time I spoke in a new place, <clears throat> the first topic, whether I went back or not, whether I was moving to the community to pastor or not, the first time I spoke in a church, I would talk about God's grace. Amen. And that's exactly what I want to do today. There is nothing more wonderful than God's scandalous grace. Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, we're going to open your word today. We're going to consider your bountiful, unbelievably rich, yes, scandalous too, grace. Give us insights we haven't had before. Open our eyes. May we treasure your grace more than ever. As a result of being here today, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been said that Christianity, first and foremost, is a religion of grace. And that's certainly true. But even so, and even among Seventh-day Adventists, I would suggest that grace is not well understood. It's often not truly believed. We use the word a great deal. We even have some definitions that we hear over and over again. But we rarely delve deeply into what grace means. In his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, Philip Yancey points out that part of our problem is in the nature of grace itself. Grace is scandalous. It's hard to accept when we see it manifested toward others. It's hard to believe, and it's hard to personally receive. Grace shocks us in what it offers. It is truly not of this world. It frightens us. Yes, that's the right word. It sometimes frightens us with what it does for sinners. Grace teaches that God does for others what we would never do for them. We would save the not so bad. God starts with prostitutes and works downward from there. Grace is a gift that costs everything to the giver and nothing at all to the receiver. 
It is given to those who barely deserve it. Well, barely deserve it? No. It is given to those who don't deserve it. They barely recognize it. They hardly appreciate it. That's why God alone gets the glory when it comes to our salvation. Amen. Jesus did all the work of grace when he died on the cross. In the end, grace means that no one is too bad to be saved, but it also means that some people may be too good to be saved. That is, uh, they may have such a high opinion of themselves that they think they don't really need God's grace, or at least not the full amount of what he offers. God's grace can't help you until you are desperate enough to receive it. Beans Cafe. I don't suppose you know much about Beans Cafe. I see one head nodding over here. Beans Cafe began with a simple vision. It was a warm place where those in need can find comfort, warmth, and a helping hand. A lady named Lynn Ballou, a professor, and her daughter, whose nickname was Bean, hence the name Beans Cafe, they moved to Alaska in 1978 and they began to work helping those in the community. They started a shelter. She named the shelter because it offered meals to anyone who needed them, Beans Cafe. In 1979, Lynn leased an empty warehouse across from the Sheridan Hotel in downtown Anchorage. The first to arrive were the street people. And they actually helped paint, remodel, arrange furniture, organize the space, all of that. And word spread of Lynn's efforts. And people began to support. And pretty soon a vision was realized. It was a place for the homeless and hungry to eat, rest, read, watch TV, make phone calls, just relax, whatever they needed. And in 1985, Beans Cafe relocated to a new building with new facilities, new programs, new services. And I just love the premise on which this organization was founded. Here it is in their words. The underlying premise of Beans Cafe is a deep belief in the inherent dignity of every person, a belief that people respond with kindness when treated kindly, with trust when trusted, and respectfully when respected. Their mission is to feed the hungry and the homeless without discrimination during the day. In other words, they don't offer any nighttime meals. Why do I mention Beans Cafe? Well, some years ago, we were living in Alaska, living in Anchorage. I was working in the conference there. And I had occasion to get acquainted with a Dr. Kraft, a retired physician who was a member of the O'Malley Church. Dr. Kraft became chair of our school board there in Anchorage. And whenever he had a particular need on the weekend or during the holidays or, or during the summer, a particular need at the school, maybe to mow some grass, maybe to do some weeding, maybe to, uh, you name it. Dr. Kraft would make his way to Beans Cafe in downtown Anchorage. And he would talk to the men and women who had arrived there for meals. And he would offer jobs to them maybe just for a few hours, perhaps all day, depended on the job. There were always takers, and while their industriousness and skill sets might vary a great deal, their efforts were always appreciated. And they appreciated Dr. Kraft in return. His kindness, his concern, his generosity. All of which reminds me of a parable in Scripture. Let's begin by reading it. Matthew 20, verses 1 and 2. Read with me. For the kingdom of heaven is like a what? 
landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. Now when he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius a day, he sent them into his vineyard. This would have been a very typical scene in Bible days. Just as we have employment agencies today, just as it was at Bean's Cafe back then, in the first century, there were places where day laborers gathered to seek work. These workers were unskilled. They were near the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. In fact, many of them lived at a level not much above that of the beggars we read about in Scripture. These laborers worked from job to job, each of which might last no more than a day. Because they had no guarantee of work, beyond what they might be doing at the time, they would gather in the marketplace before dawn to be available for hiring. Working in a vineyard is not an easy job. At harvest time, which typically is in July and August there in Palestine, the grapes had generally uh, to be picked in temperatures of around 85 degrees. And just as the crops in our area have to be harvested while the weather's good, so too the grapes had to be gathered in quickly before the bad weather set in later in the fall. And if for some reason the grapes were slow in ripening, the time for harvest could be compressed, shortened significantly. Consequently, grape harvest was always a hectic and demanding time. Well, the workers in this parable were promised the pay of a denarius. That was the wage of a Roman soldier in the day. It's about $50 in today's terms. Now that might not sound like much this day and age, but it meant a great deal to those listening to Jesus' story. Because you see, being a Roman soldier, while not the most prestigious or glorious job in the world, it was certainly higher up the social ladder than that of the common laborer. In other words, a promise of a denarius to these workers would have been very generous. So they jumped at the opportunity. They agreed to the rate with great eagerness. Let's continue. And he went out about the third hour, that's the landowner. He went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, I will give you. So they went. Again, he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing idle and he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard and whatever is right, you will receive. Verse 4, whatever is right, I will give you. Verse 7, whatever is right, you will receive. That reveals a good deal, I would say, about the landowner. Apparently, word had gotten out that he could be trusted. The owner doesn't promise them a particular wage like he had at 6 a.m., Rather, he says, whatever is right. And they believed him. There's some other interesting phrases here, too. The phrases saw others standing idle 
in verse 3 and, and found others standing idle in verse 6. At first reading, it might imply that these are lazy people. No, no. Rather, it's a desire for employment. In other words, when you showed up in the marketplace seeking a job for the day, and you weren't hired at 6 a.m., and you waited till 9 a.m., and you waited till 12 p.m., and you waited till 3 p.m., why'd you wait? In the hopes of a job. Standing idle is something they did until they were hired. This pattern continued all day long, even to the 11th hour. You see, the Jewish workday began at 6 a.m. That was called the first hour. The third hour was at 9, the sixth hour at noon, and so forth. What would the 11th hour then be? 5 p.m. It's at this point that this parable takes a dramatic turn. Under normal circumstances, by the 11th hour, or 5 p.m., the work on most plantations was winding down. The laborers waiting for work by this time would have largely lost hope. Yet on this particular day, it was different. Because of the generosity of the landowner, it is clear that he understood and was interested not only in his vineyard, but also in the unemployed. So when evening had come, the owner of the vineyard said to his steward, call the laborers and give them their wages, beginning with what? The last to the first. Oh my. The typical mode of payment back then was like it is today. First come, first serve. Work the longest, get paid first. But not surprisingly, Jesus turns it upside down. Last come, first served. Can you imagine what was going through the minds of those who had begun their work at 6 a.m.? What happened? Well, the story tells us. When those came who were hired about the 11th hour, they each received what? A denarius. But when the first came, they supposed that they would receive more. And they likewise received each, what? A denarius. Though Jesus doesn't say it explicitly in his parable, the implication is really clear. All of the workers, up to those hired first, in other words, those 5 p.m. workers, those 3 p.m. workers, those 12 noon workers, those 9 a.m. workers, all of them apparently received a denarius. Because of human nature, we can imagine how the laborers who worked all day felt as all of the part day workers got paid what they were promised. Why, if the owner gave them 50 bucks for working one hour, or three hours, or six hours, you know, what about us who worked 12 hours? Why, we stand to gain the bundle. But their hopes were dashed. They received the same pay. And in verses 11 and 12, we discover that the workers' attitudes headed south in a hurry. And when they had received it, they complained against the landowner, saying, these last men have worked only one hour, and you made them equal to us who have borne the burden and the heat of the day. Remember, working in the vineyard was hard work. 
It involved laboring on a hillside in the heat of the day with few breaks. I'll bet we, uh, if be honest with yourself, I bet all of us can sympathize with those workers. We understand their complaints. Their joy turned to anger as they realized that they had received the same pay as those who had worked for only one hour, and as such, they were determined not to leave until they received satisfaction from the landowner. However, when we think about it, we discover that this is only a symptom of the real problem. You see, they were upset that the landowner had made all the other workers equal to them. I can see it now. Those full day workers angrily confronting the owner for what they perceived to be unfair treatment. And I suspect that the most outspoken man of the lot was right there in the owner's face, so to speak. And what was his response? Well, let's read about it. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go your way. I wish to give to the last man the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I wish with my own things? Or is your eye evil because I am good? Wow. Wow. The owner completely refutes the worker's argument. The word translated friend in this verse in the original language, it's not a term we use for close friend at all. <laughs> Rather, it's a casual companion. In other words, someone that uh, the landowner barely knew. But since he addresses this one person, we can assume rightfully that the friend probably had become the spokesman for the group. And the owner clearly says, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree to work for a denarius? Before six that morning, they had agreed with the owner on a price for their labor. At that time, 50 bucks sounded very generous. Both sides had lived up to their ends of the bargain. What the landowner paid other laborers or what the landowner did with his money was no business of anyone else. You know, if the story had been a little bit different and the landowner had chosen to give half his wealth to the poorest worker of the lot, that would not be unjust either. In fact, I dare say that at that point we might likely admire him. In any case, Jesus brings the parable to its appropriate end in verse 16. So the last will be first, and the first last, for many are called, but few are chosen. In the kingdom of God, our perceived position makes no difference because God shows no partiality. In God's economy, things are often just opposite of what we expect. Grace has an edge to it. It's challenging, it's even disturbing when we think about that parable. If we're honest, we'd have to admit that grace even scandalizes us. Grace is not the way we normally do things. So then the question comes, well, how do we apply a parable like this? Do we simply accept the fact that others may be saved later than us or 
who worked less than us in the kingdom of God? Well, I know some Christians who say, yeah, I can handle that. But that's not the way God views grace. I think there's more in this passage that God wants us to learn. Lesson one, God's grace is what? A gift. Remember the, the problem in this text. It's not the injustice of a mean and cruel landowner. The problem is the scandal of a gracious and loving farmer. In fact, verse 15 asks the question, are you envious because I am generous? One of the most harmful sins we can commit as God's children is taking God's grace for granted. Pastor John MacArthur puts it this way in one of his books. The charge of unfairness was not grounded in a love for justice. That's what they were saying, right? You gave them more, so I deserve more. More than they. The charge of unfairness was not grounded in a love for justice, but in the selfish assumption that the extra pay they wanted was pay they deserved. Think about that for a minute. It's so easy to take grace for granted. After a time, we come to demand God's grace the same way that these workers demanded it of the landowner. Verse 10 says they expected to receive more. But in the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as merit. God's grace is granted according to his good pleasure. I discovered as I was reading, I discovered there's another parable that was making the rounds at the time of Jesus. It wasn't his parable. It was a take on this one. In this version, the workers who came last worked so hard they produced more than all the others put together. They earned the denarius they got for one hour of work. You know, we like the sound of that parable better, don't we? Why they work so hard? Uh, to us capitalistic Americans, it sounds great. But that's not the story Jesus told in his version. Everyone got paid the same no matter how much they produced. We can identify we can identify with employees who put in a full day's work rather than the add-ons at the end of the day. We like to think of ourselves as responsible workers. And this employer's strange behavior baffles us. But let's not miss the point of the story. God dispenses gifts not wages. If it's a wage we want from God, the Bible says that our salary is already figured out for us. If we want to be rewarded for merit, if we want to be compensated for hard work, then Romans 6.23 spells out how we will be paid. For the wages of sin is what? Death. Death. But if we want to receive what God wants to freely give us, then the last part of that verse offers something far better than just compensation. It offers what? Eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the what? Gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. If we want to receive what God freely gives us, 
Well, Paul has a little more to say. For by what? Grace. You have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the what? Gift of God, not of work. And then he tells why. Lest anyone should boast. Let me mention two truths that can radically transform your way of thinking and your way of living. Those truths are found in Scripture very clearly, and they're found in writings of numerous other authors. But I particularly like the way that Philip Yancey expresses them in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace. There is, what? Nothing you can do to make God love you more. Do you believe that? There is, how much? Nothing you can do to make God love you less. We spend a lot of our time worrying about behavior. Why, if I do this, God won't like me. That's not what the Bible says. Or, or if I do this, he'll be so happy. Oh, friends, there's nothing we can do to merit grace. Like a gift, the only thing you can do with grace is receive it. Lesson number two, God's grace tells us we are of great value. How many of you have ever struggled with feelings of incompetence? Don't raise your hands. <laughs> or, or maybe discontent. Or maybe you've wished for a greater spiritual gift or a more important ministry. Have you ever felt inferior to others across the aisle in church and thus less important than they? Think with me for a minute about those who were not hired until 5 p.m. They watched, they waited, while the other workers were hired, they knew they would probably not get paid that day. And they probably wouldn't even be able to buy any food for supper that night. All day long they were passed over, like the little boy chosen last for kickball at recess time. But this parable shows us the Lord's passion for the forgotten. You see, usually the best and the strongest were picked in the marketplace before 6 a.m. The five o'clock workers were the leftovers, the least skilled. Who in their right mind would pick them? Well, these workers really represent each of us. When we think about it, what do we have to offer to the Lord? Does he need our intellect? No. Does he need our strength? No. Does he need our money? No. Does he need our good deeds? No. You see, no one is more worthy than another to receive salvation because we're all unworthy. Now notice what I said, unworthy, not worthless. In fact, we are of great value. Lesson number three, oh, excuse me, before lesson number three, a text in Luke 12. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies and not one of them is forgotten before God? 
Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, you are of what? More value than many sparrows. And that brings us to our third lesson. Grace makes us equal with everyone else. The workers complain in verse 12 fascinates me. You have made them equal to us, they said. The all-day workers, they didn't complain about their wages, per se, because they knew their pay was generous. They had agreed to those wages. They were upset because they wanted to be superior. You see, the Greek word translated complained in verse 11 is in the imperfect tense, which means that they complained not just once, but fell into a constant state of complaining. Complaining, grumbling. This helps us see what kind of workers they really were. They didn't say, you've put us on a par with the latecomers. Instead, they grumbled, you've put them on a par with us. They were not only dissatisfied with what they had received, they were envious of what had been given to the others. They emphasized that they had borne the burden of the work in the sweltering heat of the day. And compared to these upstarts who only worked an hour, the 6 a.m. workers thought they were worth a lot more. There's a part of you and me <clears throat> that wants God to give us grades so we can compare ourselves to other people. And if the truth were known, many of us think God has given us an A, and others are barely passing the class. Do you put yourself above other people? Do I? It's a question worth thinking about. I want you to notice the tragic chain of events that took place in the hearts of these workers. They started by comparing themselves with others, which led to coveting, which led to complaining, which led ultimately to criticizing. Do you struggle with coveting, complaining, criticizing? <laughs> if so, go back to the root of the whole thing and stop comparing yourself with others. God declares that in the economy of grace, we are all equal. Praise his name. The ego trip is dangerous. Paul well understood that. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think how? Soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Friends, let's stop being so hard on other people. If you find yourself in the pattern of, of looking for things that don't seem fair, refuse to criticize. It's ironic, isn't it? We want grace for ourselves, but we don't always extend grace to others. Grace applied to us always seems good and nice and right. But grace given to others, why sometimes, quite frankly, that disturbs us. Be gracious. Cut others some slack. Your sin doesn't smell any better than mine does. It really doesn't. Let's treat people the way we want to be treated because grace makes us equal to everyone else. Finally, lesson four. Grace offers us a chance to start over. The Christian life is really a series of new beginnings. 
That's what grace is all about. No one is first. No one is last. I'm not better than you, and you're not better than me. You're no worse than I am, and I'm no worse than you are. We're all, what? Sinners. In need of the cleansing grace of Christ. That's why I think Jesus used such radical language in verse 16 about the first and the last. Notice what he said. So the last will be first and the first will be last. But I want you to look at another verse. The last verse of chapter 19. It, it's a verse that punctuates Jesus' previous conversation with his disciples. But it also serves as a preface to this parable. And what does it say? But many who are first will be last, and the last first. <clears throat> he says it a little differently here. <laughs> he turns it on its head, but the result is the same. The first and the last, the last and the first, all blur together. It's as if Jesus is trying to make the point that first and last simply doesn't matter in the kingdom of God. Amen. Grace is not about finishing first. It is not about finishing last. It's about not counting at all. It's about not keeping score. It's about having a do-over, a fresh start, whenever you want it, whenever you need it. So do you want a fresh start today? You can have one. How do you find God's grace? Simple. Reach out and accept it. That's all. That's all. The more you feel your need for grace, the better you're a candidate you are to receive it. Hold out your empty hands and ask God for his grace. You will not be turned away. It's never too late. Though your sins are as scarlet, God says they will be white as snow. That's the miracle, the wonder, the scandal, the shock of God's grace. It's really truly out of this world, for no one in this world would have thought of something quite like this. As Pastor Brian Bill puts it, here is good news for sinners. Free grace, free grace, Free grace. Shout it, sing it, tell it, share it. And above all else, believe it. For in believing, you will be saved. When we get to heaven, there will be no contest to see who is the most deserving of God's grace. Because no one deserves it. There will only be one contest in heaven. When we look back and see what we were before, when we see the pit from which Jesus rescued us, when we recall how confused we were living in this world, and when we remember how God reached out and hired us into his family to work in his vineyard. And when we see how he held us in his hand, and when we see Jesus who loved us and gave himself for us face to face, <laughs> the only contest will be to see which of us sing the loudest Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, 
but now am what? Found. Was blind, but now I see. There's a hymn that expresses our gratitude to God for His grace. It's not in your hymnal. I'm going to ask Juneville to come up and play it. I'm going to put the words on the screen. I want you to stand with me and sing a hymn of gratitude for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Father in heaven, we don't begin to understand your grace. But oh, how grateful we are to receive it. Thank you. Thank you for sending your Son. Thank you for making it possible to be reunited with you one day soon. Oh, what marvelous grace. And we praise you for it. And we thank you for it. In the name of your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.